Now, the uh, spirit energy today is a pretty heavy, which you've probably already noticed. So what we'd just like to do for a moment before we begin is just to have a prayer to God to just look after us and help us to be open today to the material and help us to be open to our emotions so that the spirits can't influence us very much with regard to hearing things. If you could just do that for a moment. Um, just would like to clear away some of that heaviness that we've brought along with us today. There has been quite a lot of uh, pretty heavy spirit influence uh, on many of you, I know that, and uh, and it's understandable, given many of you are attempting to progress and they, many of the spirits around you want you to not progress. So that's, uh, that's a good sign that you've gotten out of the addiction and into the bribe, sorry, out of the bribery and the addiction and uh, now you're getting blackmailed a bit. So, so that's usually a good indication that things are improving, actually, with regard to your spirit interaction. But today's talk is uh, called, it's part of the Human Soul series. So it's part of the Human Soul series of talks and the subject of the talk that I've chosen today is the facade self. And it's an extension of a talk that myself and Mary gave in Melbourne uh, earlier in the year where we introduced the three selves. There was the facade self and then there was the damaged self and then there was the pure self or the real self. And, um, and remember we said that God created the real self, your parents created the damaged self, or the parents and the environment created the damaged self, and you created the facade. And what we notice happening a lot is that a lot of people are having a lot of difficulty with the facade. In fact, it's actually generally... Once you've dealt with the facade, it is very easy to feel your damaged self. Very easy to feel it and also to release it as well. And usually all the difficulties that we face, facing the damaged self or releasing the emotions of damage that have been done by the environment, almost all of them are because we still have the facade in play in some way. So what I'd like to do today is talk to you about this facade self in more detail to give you a bit of assistance in terms of how to break through the facade and get to the deeper, the real selves, if you like, the real self and also the, the damaged self. Now, you could think of the human soul in a way and what happens to it is a bit like an egg. So if you can think of it, the, the core or the yolk of the egg is your real self. The self that God created. And then if you could think of the album around the outside of that, that it exists, the yolk exists in, as the damaged self and then if you could think of the shell of the egg which isn't very thick right the way around the outside so all of that area in there but it is quite hard and brittle if you think about that you could call that the facade self The real self is all soft and squishy. 
right? In that, in that it doesn't have a large amount of resistance, it doesn't have a large amount of anger, it doesn't have a large amount of trying to reject things, and, you know, push things away. It's not rebellious, it just goes with the flow. And the damaged self, interestingly enough, is often very similar to that. It's also quite squishy in the sense that it's quite easy to actually feel the emotions of the damaged self once you get through the facade. But the facade self is like the shell of an egg. And the shell of an egg is pretty hard. And in fact, if you squeeze the egg in a certain direction, it's impossible for the majority of people to break that egg. So if you, you, you squeeze the egg lengthways and you really push, it, push down on it, you've, it's very, very hard for it to break, in fact. And it's only when there's a crack in the shell under those circumstances when you're pushing down on the ends, for trying to force the egg into breaking. It's only when there's a crack in the egg that it actually breaks apart. But there's another way that you can break the egg, isn't there? Rather than trying to break it on the ends by pushing it or squeezing it or putting it under pressure, you can just go along and tap the side of the egg on something that's hard. And the egg now has a crack and the shell is automatically easy to break and we can just reach our fingers there and crack it apart. Something that would before took huge amounts of force to break now can be broken quite simply. So we need to find what is the shell cracker for our facade self. <laughs> and that, that is truth. Truth. But it's not the forcing of truth, all right? But rather the, just the tap of truth, if you like. You know, what, what, a lot of times what we're trying to do is we're trying to force ourselves to get from one condition to another. And that's called the natural love path. But we're still, many of us are still on it because we're trying to force ourselves to get from one condition to another. So in other words, what we do is we look at ourself, which is often the facade self looking at the damaged self, and the facade self looks at the damaged self and says, I don't like that particular thing that you are. So what I'm going to do, because I don't like that particular thing, in other words, because I judge it, as not being worthy of me or not being something I want or something that looks good to others or whatever, because I judge it, I then go into this place where I am using my facade to, to judge the damaged self and not allowing, in fact, truth to ever enter me. And this is what we'd probably like to speak about today, what we do with our facade. Does that sound all right with you? Can we talk about that? Okay. Now, I've mentioned that truth is the shell cracker, if you like. The, the thing that just puts a hole, if you like, in the edge of the cell and can t help us take the shell away. But truth has to be, and by the way, that noise that you're hearing, if you're finding it very irritating, there's two rotating things on the top of this hall and uh, they're both going around and one of them's not going around too well. <laughs> so we have to do something about that before next talk. But truth is like this shell cracker who, that, that, is now, um, that we can now use to, to punch, in, punch into our damaged self. We can now access our damaged self. The problem is, for the majority of us, we do not want to access our damaged self. We have huge resistance to accessing our damaged self. What are the reasons for the resistance, do you think? What are the main reasons why we resist finding and feeling this part of ourselves? Well, let's, uh, let's just, if we go Natalie with the microphones, if we can have the microphones, we've got Pierre on one side and Peter on the other. 
Yeah. Off. So on. Hello. Okay. <laughs> um, I found it to be fear of what's actually damaged in me. Like it's quite terrifying because the facade stops you from seeing it. So why would you be afraid of the damage? What, what, what things cause you to be afraid of the damage? Yeah, Alex, right at the back, thanks. Sorry, Peter, right at the back, if I can go right at the back where Alex is, yeah. Um, hello. Um, just the fear of how big it might be. So it's a fear of the size of the error? Yeah. It's scope, shall we call it? Yeah. The scope of error? And that, and that you won't survive it? It's too big. It's right, and this is yeah. the scope of the error. It doesn't really matter, does it? It's this belief that we have that we cannot survive if we feel it. Yep. So that's one thing that causes this. If we come down, yep. You just. Uh, the fear of feeling powerless. When you say the fear of feeling powerless, um, can you elaborate more in terms of what? Um, just uh, the damage feels so like deeply hurt and the feeling of the child feeling completely um, powerless. Um, in but the when face you of say a fear of feeling powerless, can you see that there's got to be something underneath that why are you afraid of powerlessness? What, 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 what causes us to be afraid of the feeling of powerlessness? It, can you see how there's layers of what's going on for us? And for many of us, we'll say, oh, I, I'm afraid of being powerless. But we're not actually looking at why are we afraid of being powerless? There's got to be a reason why. What would be a reason why? Being hurt again. Okay, so that's the real issue, isn't it? The feeling, well, it's not a fear of powerlessness so much as a fear of getting hurt another time in a similar way that you got hurt the last time. So being hurt again, yeah. If we go, just uh, um, Justin, thanks, thanks, and just, yeah, and then we'll work our way down here. Uh, it, it actually destroys the illusion that, uh, like, for me, for example, I, I've built up this illusion of what I think I am. Yes. And then now, having to face the reality of not being that, but being something completely different. Yes. It, it's our investment in holding on to the illusion. We have a reason why we want to hold on to the illusion. So can we, can we call this an investment in the facade? And this is something we want to talk about in more detail as we go along. We'll talk about the investment in, that we have in the facade. Yeah. Any other primary fears that we have? So we come down. Um. Just um, going to the, the, um, the major hole, like when you feel it, you just feel like there's going to be a hole. And <clears throat> one of the reasons why I don't really like to feel my damaged self is because I don't have um, much faith. Like, I feel, if I feel that awful feeling, it's going to just be like, um, I don't know, like a big chunk. Like, it almost feels like my heart's going to get ripped out and... Nothing's going to replace it. Like, I have no faith that that massive void is going to yep. be filled with love again. Like, it just feels... So can I summarise that as, I believe my damaged self is my real self. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like there's no, like, not much faith. Like, um, there's no way that I could possibly survive from this if anything it's going to make it worse well yeah and and if we look at this belief this belief that we have that the damaged self is the real self if you if if the damaged self is the real self and you take away the damaged self who have you got left you just feel empty and like it's not the yeah like yeah. i guess a lack of faith like if i feel this horrible feeling i'm just going to be left with an emptiness in my soul and it's just going to leave me exposed and yuck Right. So for me, sort of like a lack of faith, maybe why I don't 
like to look into my damaged self because I feel like it's not going to repair or something. Yeah, but let's, we'll talk about the lack of faith in a minute. But uh, I feel really it's this belief that the damaged self is the real self that causes us a lot of trouble. Mm. And we need to focus on that for a moment. Who was next uh, down here? That was Angela? I was just going to say fear of the grief. So we're afraid of how much grief we actually have. So we're, well, we're afraid of how much hurt we actually have of the hurt itself. So we're afraid of the hurt itself. Oops. Yep. yep. Uh, fear of what other people might think. Yes, so it's a fear of, um, what would you call that, the image being tarnished? Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's a fear of judgment, as somebody else mentioned over there, yep. So when we say it's a fear, why would we be afraid of how other people think of us? Why do you feel there's a, we would be afraid of that? Because it, it's just a thought. <laughs> It's nothing more than a thought. Can, can you, can you, if we can, if we can sort of, what we want to do with, what I'm trying to do or help you do with these fears that you're listing is to help you see that we often say the words of a specific fear without really giving it much consideration. We don't really give it much consideration. So we say, oh, I feel powerless. And, and we, get, we don't go, Actually, why do I feel powerless? And what, why is powerless a bad emotion to feel anyway? Why, why do I feel it's such a bad emotion to feel? Well, it's just an emotion. Um, and it's like any other emotion. Why, why do I then make it important? What's going on for me? You, we don't often consider it to that depth. We just go, I feel powerless and you're making me feel powerless. We often get angry with the person who caused me to feel powerless and so forth. And in the end, we're not really addressing the underlying issue. So, so what we need to do is be really specific here. So with regard to the fear, so um, if we go up the back, uh, to Simon, is Simon up there? A uh, fear of punishment? Yeah, so, so can you see that a lot of it is related to the potential of pain? And, and see in our childhoods, we have often had a lot of pain, not just emotional pain, but also physical pain. Many of us in our childhood, it's very rare to find a person, uh, particularly you know, above 20 to 30 years of age, who has not been spanked or, or harmed in some way like that from their parents, isn't it? Many of us as parents have done it to our own children. So it's very rare to actually find a person who has not been on the receiving end of parental violence. And therefore, we have all of this pain, physical pain, a fear of physical pain associated with that. And we do a lot to prevent pain. We do, we do, we do far too much, in fact, to prevent pain. Yeah. If we come over here. Yeah. Yeah. I personally don't like what I see when I look at my damaged self. So if I drop the facade, then I think, how can anybody else love me? Uh, yes, very good question. So a lot of times there is this issue of, will I be loved? And inside of us, the answer to that question is generally, I definitely will not be. So we automatically have made that judgment ourselves that we will definitely not be loved if, if, if we access that self. All right. Perhaps the facade is like a mask that we've been wearing for a long, long time. It's definitely a mask, yep. And it feels comfortable in there. I don't know who I am, but there's a great fear of, yep. of losing that mask, not knowing who I am. Can you see how a lot of our reasoning is not very logical, though? Like, is, is it more comfortable... Uh, well, let's say you're home by yourself. Is it more comfortable 
wearing clothes or not wearing clothes? Not. Isn't it generally more comfortable not wearing clothes, generally, if you're, if you're home by yourself? Um, now, of course, when somebody else walks in the door, then you've got a lot of emotional discomforts that you have to work your way through about that. But what I'm saying is that, is that every time we put something on us, our discomfort levels usually, from a physical perspective, rise. So if all of you rocked up today with a big snowsuit on, you know, and it's 25, 30 degrees outside or so, and you'd already be uncomfortable, would you not? And yet for most of us, we've got a great big snowsuit on, suit on that we're carrying around emotionally, and we then say that that's safe, when the reality is we're sweating like a pig inside of it, and we can't stand the thing on us, but we just don't want to deal with it. And you see, a lot of times, we, when you say you like the mask, we're not being very logical about the mask. We're not being logical about the, the amount of weight that we're carrying around with us by carrying around this mask. Like, this is the hard part of the egg, and the rest of the egg is just going to flow if, if we let the hard part go. But we want the hard part. And this is our problem. We want this hard part to remain intact so that we don't have to access the rest. And we use a lot of intellectual reasoning, which isn't very logical, in order to maintain the facade. And this is what we want to also address today. Yep. If we go to Lorleen. Um. I think this is before I get to the fear, and it's the anger. Yep, that's very good. And um, I found that um, because I have started to see a bit of the damaged self, I get really angry. And um, I'm afraid of that anger because uh, the degree of anger that I'm going to, is, there's still a lot more there. And I've pass this on to my own daughter. So I feel like if I'm this angry with my mother, she's going to be this angry with me. And it makes me afraid to feel that anger. But why do you have the anger in the first place, Lorleen? Um, because I don't want to feel that hurt. You don't want to feel that pain? Yeah. Is that the reason why you feel that? Well, um, when I found out things, I've got really angry because I feel it's unjust, it's unfair and all the rest. And yeah, see I put to you that actually it's not uh, necessarily our unwillingness to feel the pain that causes our anger, mm -hmm. but rather our belief systems about the pain that cause our anger. Can everyone see the difference between those two things? You see, you see most of us in our day-to-day -day life cope with a certain degree of pain already. How many of you feel the physical f feeling of pain right at the moment while you're sitting down? So, uh, and aren't you coping with it? Like, aren't you dealing with it? Like, you, you're still here, you're still functioning, you're still doing things in your day-to-day -day life. And in fact, many of us cope with quite high levels of pain in our day-to-day -day life. And we don't, we're not afraid of it. If we were afraid of it, we'd be going to the doctor like a hypochondriac every second minute to try to fix it up, wouldn't we? Um, so the reality is we have generally uh, quite a good understanding, well, when I say quite a good understanding, we have quite a, quite a good understanding that most of us live in a state of pain, particularly physical pain, quite a lot. Now, from an emotional pain perspective, how many of you feel that you have emotional pain that you have right now? Uh, that you can feel inside of you, yeah? So, so we're living with that emotional pain right now. So the reality is we have the pain and the reality also is that we can feel it right now. And we're not afraid of feeling that level of pain. So what is the issue with regard to pain? Is it, is it to do with the fact that we have it or what? It can't be to do with the fact that we have it, can it? Because we all recognise that we have it. So it's got to be something else. So what is it? What is the issue we have with pain? Shall we? If we go up the... Back there. Yeah, right up. That's it. Yep. Keep your hand up, Michelle. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, I just feel really ashamed. So feel that I don't even want to look at my damaged self because of how much shame is there. So there's a feeling, the fear, you could say a fear of shame. Yeah. But is that, what about the pain question that I asked? Does anyone have, if we come, oh, if we go out to back to Joe. We want to be able to manage our pain. This is our problem, you see. It's our belief about the management. Or if we use another word that many of you are used to using, the level of control that you want over your pain. Everyone has a different level of control they want over their pain. Why do we want to have things at a certain level of control? What, what happens to us when we seem like we go out of control? What, what, what do we feel then? What's the feeling we feel then? We go. That I'm going crazy. Okay, so this is about psychological issues now that we're talking about to a degree, isn't it? The issue of am I crazy? is a big part of why we want control. Because as, as, as soon as we feel the pain to a level that we need to experience it, it looks like we're now out of control. And, and it's not just the judgment of the world we're worried about in that place. It's more what we're worried about is our own judgment of ourselves. Am I losing my mind now is where we often go. And now that's a, pretty, that's a pretty difficult place to face, is it not? The fact that you might be losing your mind at any one point in time. So that, there's a lot of fear in that and therefore desire to manage and control. And when the management and control systems fail, then rage puts them back in place. So we're using our anger to put the management and control systems we have back in place to make them dominant again so that we can not feel that we're crazy or feel that other people think we're crazy. Yeah? If we come down here and then up to Alex at the back. Um, AJ, is craziness an overwhelm of fear? Like, is that what craziness is? Um, it can be an overwhelm of a number of different emotions, not just fear. So, so... Obviously, the feeling of I, am I crazy comes from fear, but often we can be overwhelmed in all sorts of ways that can cause us to feel that we're crazy. You can actually be overwhelmed with pleasure and then think you're crazy as well. So there are, there, it's not just a matter of your fear that causes you to feel those things. But the belief system, this, this fear of the state of being crazy is an issue we need to deal with. Again, it's a belief that we have in our soul, an emotion that we have in our soul, that the feeling of crazy is something that I must avoid at all costs. So in other words, instead of allowing the emotion to be present, that I'm crazy, I'm now trying to shut down that emotion. And this is why also when somebody else tells you you're crazy, they can get control of you very easily. Right? You're just a crazy idiot. Once they say that to you, and with the level of fear that we have about that state, we then almost will do anything they want in order to prove that we're not crazy. Right? Which in itself is crazy to do. So it's a bit strange how we do these things. Thanks, Liz. Which thing brings me to being crazy is not normal. It's um, out of the box. Mm -hmm. It's not conforming to society and how everybody else is. Like even being here, I have family that think I'm crazy. Exactly. So it's so not it, normal. It's, yeah. diff it's different. It's not what everyone else thinks or believes en masse. Yeah. We, we had some interesting emails that Mary just talked about with me. I haven't seen them yet, but Mary read them this morning. And... Um, and she, and she said one of, one, of the, one of them was a lady who heard about myself and Mary and then just said, oh, what crazy nutters. And they were talking about on the particular day, they, were, they actually live near our, near our house, this couple. And um, 
they would they have a holiday house out there and they drive out there and th as they were driving out they were commenting to each other how crazy we were and and so forth and so forth and and the woman got quite uh like derogatory about it right in terms of how crazy we were and so forth and to to her husband not to anyone else while they were driving and she was relating this to us in this email and she she uh, and he eventually says actually darling you're you're not being very nice right at the moment. Like, so <laughs> he actually reminded her that she wasn't being very nice. And then because she felt that, that she wasn't being very nice, she decided to actually get on the internet and have a look at some of the YouTube presentations. And then once she did that, she realised that perhaps what we were saying at least wasn't as crazy as what she thought it would be. And, and she actually sent us an email thanking us for putting the information on YouTube. And... We had another fellow who emailed us again today, interestingly, um, who's, who um, went through a very similar thing. He said, he said basically his original, his original feelings were that Mary and myself must be crazy and he was willing to completely attack us with other people as a result of that. So he felt like he just wanted to you know, attack that position and, and so forth. But then for some reason, I can't remember it now, Oh, that's right. He got on YouTube as well and, uh, and watched a couple of presentations, right? And then he said, so, so he said, now I can't work out whether you're crazy or not, but what you're saying like, makes a lot of sense. And, and I can't say that you're crazy because what, you know, what you're saying makes a lot of sense and not only makes a lot of sense, but you don't seem to be a crazy person. <laughs> and now he's, he's decided now what he's doing is wondering whether he's crazy, believing me. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was a lovely email. Huh? And, and this is where this gets back to this feeling, right, that we have that, that whenever we do something that's just out of the ordinary, something that society or particularly family cannot particularly accept us doing, we're automatically generally viewed as crazy. And this is a very strong method that the world and our families use to get us to conform back into what doesn't scare them anymore. So you see, it gets us to not make them afraid anymore. So if they do what, if we do what they define as not crazy, then they don't have to feel any of those feelings or emotions. But if we start doing something that defines, that they define as crazy, now they start questioning, what have I done wrong? I must be a bad mother or father or sister or brother or something. What have, you know, and there's, they go down this track of actually starting to blame themselves. But, but underneath all of that is an emotion of wanting to avoid their own feelings of being crazy, which is something that they take. Ivana thinks? Um, I was just wondering um, if it's possible to sort of let go of the facade in some areas um, but not other areas? Definitely. Yeah. It's definitely possible, yeah. And, and usually highly likely because the areas that we have more damage that we don't like or the damage that we judge and we want to talk about this, the damage that we judge is going to be the area that we're less likely to let go of the facade. Yeah. So, for example, if, uh, if you have an emotion where you feel that your mum and dad spanked you and you felt the pain from it and you felt like you were disapproved of in that moment and you felt like uh, you, you, you could accept that emotionally, then there's a high likelihood you'll let go of the facade that mum and dad didn't damage you and you'll actually get into the truth, which is mum and dad did spank you and therefore perpetrate violence towards you, and then you'll cry through those emotions and release them. However, on the other hand, if you have done damage to other people, right, you may have huge amounts of judgment about that, and therefore less inclination to feel the damaged reason why you did it. Therefore, a stronger reason to hold on to the facade. And this is why the majority of us hold on to facades. We hold on to facades not because of the damage that was done to us, but rather because of the damage we've done to others that we don't want to face. All right.
and that's one main reason why we hold on to facades. And, th and it's those areas that we want to hold on to facades the longest, generally. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So, the anger is an issue too, isn't it? That's a part of this hard shell. Can you see that? It's about, the anger is all about maintaining the facade, maintaining the state where you don't have to come face to face with your true self. Right? Now, what's this self? Who created it? God. God. So therefore, everything in it is? Everything in it is perfect. So there's a part of you, inside of you at the moment, that is your real self that God created, the personality of it and everything, and everything, every part of that real self of yours is perfect. But what often happens is the damaged self becomes so strong that we then enter the facade and our facade starts thickening and compressing our damaged and real selves down into these little squished out, dried out balls and we're left with mostly facade and very little else. Everything else is under pressure inside of us. And that's what's happened to many of us is that we've, we've gone into this state not realising that this real self exists within us and can somebody, whoever is that child, can somebody please quieten them down a little so that everyone can hear. Um, so we've got this real self inside of us that God created that we've yet to even discover for many of us. And, and in fact, many of us have a lot of judgment even about the real self as well. Like, if, if you had a personality that was very gregarious and outgoing as your real self, and your parents taught you that anybody gregarious and outgoing is arrogant, then can you see you would have judgment of your real self? And therefore, every time you were gregarious and outgoing, you'd then remember your parents' damage, which was, that's really wrong, you're very arrogant now, that's their judgment of your real self, and then, and then you would then institute the facade. I'm not going to be gregarious and arrogant anymore, uh, gregarious and arrogant anymore, which is why I think it. It's not true, but I'm not going to do that anymore. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to be quiet and put on the facade of humility, the facade of um, being, being quiet and mild when the reality is inside of us we might be a totally different person. Right? So oftentimes we forget that there's this real part of us that God created. And in fact, this is the main reason why most of us don't have faith. Because we forget that God created the real part of us, this real part of us that's perfect. Yeah? We forget that completely. And when we're emotionally processing, or we're working through our different emotional injuries, we forget completely that what we're doing is we're wanting to try... To, the whole reason why we're doing this is because we want to discover what God created our real self inside of us and we need to discover her or him that's what we need to do yeah if we have a mic just just wait for the mic to come down so everyone can hear it uh, also I was thinking about fear of deception like lack of support okay so afraid of uh, deception which is another form of pain so we'll just put that over here So there's another fear that we have. Can you see the fears of accessing our damaged self are now pretty high, aren't they? Now for the majority of us, we've barely listed ours. For the majority of us, we have more than that of what we've listed on the board. So we have this great big long list of fears associated with this damaged self. We have a great big long list of anger about the damaged self 
And it's not just this kind of anger, but it's also anger relating to feeling it's unfair to have to deal with our damaged self when somebody else created our damaged self. They should have to deal with our damaged self and I should be able to sit back and watch them do it, is the way we often feel. So we have a lot of anger about our damaged self. And while we're, while we're doing this, this fear and anger creates this layer, this shell, that becomes so hard and tough that it feels sometimes almost impossible to penetrate. Um, if we, um, Simon, Simon? Jason. Jason, sorry. Sorry, Jason. AJ, I feel that with my damaged self or facade self is like a chameleon or a shapeshifter. So <laughs> when, when I'm in groups or even in one-on-one -on -one with males, females, or family members, I feel myself changing. Changing, and it's like, like you know, this fear of attack. So I'll, be, I'll mimic them, like even their laugh, their tone, their monotone. Um, that's what I've noticed with myself. So is that like a, a very uh, evolved state of self-deception? Yeah. So. So you're a good chameleon, is that what you're saying? Yeah. And, and that is true. The majority of us have become that. So unfortunately, the facade changes depending on where we go. However, that kind of facade we're generally aware of. In other words, we're generally aware that I changed myself today in order to suit you or, and changed myself yesterday in order to suit her, her, you know, or whoever we were with. That's not as damaging a facade as the facade that we actually believe to be true ourselves. Can you see the difference? It's the facade we believe to be true ourselves that actually causes most of our pain and most of our problems. It's the facade, the facade that we see ourselves doing with others but realise is not ourselves, causes less damage to ourselves in terms of accessing our damaged emotions than does the facade that we firmly believe is true. Yep. Uh, Lena, thanks. I feel a bit confused with who I am. Um, I feel quite a bit of fear that I don't know who I am. And I also feel this distance. I don't know, it's superficial, I don't know, but I feel quite distant from, from how truly I feel on, yep. a, on a minute to minute basis. Yep. And there's fear, like there's a lot of cloud of fear of even acknowledging that. Can I put to you that you will not know truly who you are until you become at one with God. So the, the reality is that the majority of us have no idea who we are. The difference is that some of us are now becoming more conscious that we have no idea of who we are, whereas the other people believe they do know who they are, and it's that person that they created. <laughs> and there's a big difference between those two states. I feel that if you're having feelings that you don't know who you are, then that is a better place to be than it is to believe you know who you are when it's not who you are. Right? However, I understand the psychological battle that goes on inside of a person not knowing who they are. It's quite difficult. But it's just an emotion. And I'll, I'll say those words to you a lot today. It's just an emotion. You see, for the majority of us, we forget that these things are just an emotion. And instead, what we finish up doing is we start viewing the emotion as the definite unalterable truth but also we don't see it as an emotion we see it as concrete we see it as something that's unchangeable whereas an emotion can just flow out of us so every emotion you face can flow if you believe it's just an emotion if you believe it's something different then it's not going to flow as well Natalie AJ, I'm just wondering, I've discovered 
from my childhood that I've taken on a lot of beliefs that I believe are true and they're actually error. Mm -hmm. And I'm learning that they're not a causal emotion, it's just a belief that I hold on to. Correct. Does this define part of my facade self because I'm holding on to these beliefs? Always. Okay. It's your beliefs that you have embraced for different reasons. Some of them are based around your parents' beliefs, but others are based as a subsequent result of the damage the parents did, or the subsequent result of the environmental damage that happened to you, or the results of your own choices that you made throughout your life that damaged yourself, they all construct your belief systems. And then your belief systems are used as the basis to make further decisions. Now, if the belief system is in error, in other words, when I say in error, I'm saying in not in harmony with God's truth, not our own. So if our belief system's not in harmony with God's truth, then it will always create further pain. The irony is we're afraid of pain, but we're constantly creating it because we're in the facade that was created by a heap of belief systems that we do not want to release from ourselves. We want to stay away from. And it's our belief systems that need to be deconstructed in order to get through this facade. And the only thing that can deconstruct belief systems is truth, God's truth. God's truth about this situation, but also God's truth about ourselves. What is God's truth about ourselves? What is God's truth about the damaged self? What actually did happen to the damaged self? What were the actual events that caused me to be damaged? They are all part of God's truth. When God's looking at us, God sees all of that. God sees the, all of the different things that have happened in the ebb and flow of our lives. And God can see it all in terms of what its cause was and what the effect was and then how we, that effect created a belief and then because of that belief we then caused another series of events as a result of those beliefs and God sees all of that. We don't. We're often just living in the addiction of the belief. That's all. Sometimes I find the best question to ask when I'm praying to God is why do I believe this? Yeah, why myself? do I believe this? And, and is, it, is it even true? Yeah. You know, quite often I hear people, they come to me with, you know, statements and I'm going, I'm sorry, but that's not even true. Like in that circumstance, that wasn't even true. So, so you're believing something that's not true. You're processing emotion relating to the belief that's not true. Are you actually releasing a causal emotion? Are you actually releasing anything from the damaged self? No. Because to release things from the damaged self, you have to process things that are actually true, things that actually happened to you, things that, you know, that were damaging that actually occurred. So you can't sit down and cry about how badly you were treated as a child when you weren't treated badly as a child and expect to get anywhere. Yep. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah. Rita, thanks. Um, I listened to a previous DVD about Adam and Eve and so how they turned away from God. And my question is, were they the first one who turned away from God? And to do that, they needed to create the facade self to be able to do that. Or um, is that too far back? No, what they did was a little different. They just decided, they made a choice or a decision, which is very similar to what I was just saying to Natalie. They made a choice or decision based on their own desires and passions. They made a choice or decision that was in disharmony with God's truth. So, but they needed to live in a, in a lie then. Well, that's what happens. Every time you make a choice and decision that's not harmonious with God's truth, you have to live the lie to believe it. And does that lie creates a facade self? Of course. Yeah. Now we've got a facade self. Yeah. So, so, but in their case, the damage was created. Remember this damaged self, part of the damaged self is what we've done to other people. Oh, yeah. Right, and and part, in terms of what's in disharmony with God's love principles of love and truth, so so anybody, even in a state of perfection, can create a damaged self. The problem for most of us is that a lot of that was created before we were even conscious of its creation. Whereas the difference between us and Ammon and a man is they created it being conscious of their choice that they were making. It's a very different decision. See, so they they had a clear set of intellectual arguments that they presented to themselves that were out of harmony with God's truth 
but that, what, that is what created their damaged self. And then they acted upon their damaged self, which then meant the facade got created. For ourselves, this damaged self began the instant we were incarnated, the instant we're conceived, we're now absorbing the emotions, the damaged emotions from our parents, that they then, during our life, don't want us to know or don't want us to feel more specifically. And that creates our facade. Our desire to get away from that creates our facade. Thank you. Karen? Okay. Uh, with that um, facade self, I think I've tried to explain to you before, um, like I've built up this facade self of myself because I've um, tried to work out who I am and I've tried to explain to you, like, I'm me and then, like, in, when I'm by myself, I've... You know, I'm thinking from the inside out and I'm, I'm a person and all that kind of stuff. And it gets to a stage where I can't even explain, I, can't, I haven't got the words to explain who I am. And, and then so I make out I'm somebody else and it just goes over and over again. So, and like you say, when you become at one with God, but um, how can you get to there when you don't know who you are and, you, and it's just like a... A big mess, yeah. In, in yeah. my view, and we'll talk about this this process of of removing the facade and getting down to the damaged self. I want to do a talk at some point in the future about the damaged self, and then at some point in the future from that, I'd like to do a talk about the real self, uh, what God actually created. But but what we need to do is deal first with the facade, the, the what we're most of us are still trying to be, in order. For, well, there's a lot of reasons why, and we need to look at our belief systems, why we have this desire to maintain our facade. Yep. Yep. So, what do we do with all of this? Well, what the majority of us do with all of this is we go, it's all too hard. <laughs> so what we do instead is we'll just hold on the facade self, we'll use our anger to manage and control our environment, so that we don't have to get any deeper into ourself, our damaged self. And most of us do not even acknowledge our fears on an emotional level. We do not acknowledge our fears. Now, remember a long time ago, I suggested during a talk that I gave years ago now about fear is your friend. It was probably, it was at Peter's home, so it was, must have been two and a half, three years ago at least maybe longer than that. And in that, I suggested to give a... to make a list of all of the things you're afraid of. Now, many of you went home and made the list. I think I told you at the time that my list was about 30-something pages of all the things I was afraid of. So most of us go home... And by the way, that was all the things that I knew I was afraid of and not the, the things that I've since discovered that I was afraid of that I didn't know at the time. But that's a different discussion. So, so we go home, we make the list. And that's as far as it goes. We make the list, but we don't feel any of it. What we do is we just made an intellectual list of being like in a process of attempting to become aware but unfortunately we don't allow ourselves to feel each fear to actually work on why we feel each fear and this is something that we need to also bear in mind with all of these different things is that it is impossible to make progress on the divine love path without actually feeling something I must feel to heal. You know what we do instead of that? The majority of us are still doing this, actually. We make a choice or decision to take an active action in order to avoid the feeling. I'll give you an illustration of this in a really... I was having a chat, I think it was to Gary and Deb the other day, and I was saying to them how I had some of these uh, feelings in my body of different types of pains. And 
Gary's suggestion was to me, do you remember? Gary's suggestion was, and Deb's suggestion was different. They both had separate suggestions. Um, Gary's suggestion was that I was it take some kind of plant, comfrey, that's right, and that would help me a lot. And Deb's suggestion was, why don't I wrap, I've got a broken rib at the moment, so why don't I wrap myself up a bit? Oh, that was yours too. No, 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 Deb's suggestion was to do some first aid on me. Yeah, that's right. Both suggestions, as I pointed out to them at the time, I said, yeah, that's very interesting. You've both asked me to skip over the emotion. So, so this basic understanding is not there that indicates that. Does that make sense? If we, if we go to the remedy, right, and later I'll be giving a talk uh, about the law of cause and effect, if we go to the effect and try to cure the effect with a remedy, we are not addressing a cause and therefore we do not understand this basic truth that I need to feel something in order to heal the problem. This, this is, whether I've got a damaged rib or not, it's the same principle. Now, I damaged my rib through a long series of emotions that I was denying. And I have to come to terms with that. You see, by the time the physical ailment appears, we are already down a long chain of denial. You see? That's the reality. Any physical ailment, any physical discomfort, by the time it appears, we're already down a long way in our denial curve. So we've got to learn to feel to heal. If we can go to... Up the back, yeah. AJ, just recently I had this awareness that I'm just afraid of everything. Yeah. And so my question to you is, when, when I go into my processing, can I have fear capping every single emotion? The reality is that fear or anger are going to be on top of pretty much everything in your damaged self for, in order for you to create a facade. However, can I address this idea that you're afraid of everything? You're not afraid of everything. It feels that way. Well, have you had children? Enter the engagement. I'm afraid of that. <laughs> no, but you have had them, haven't you? I have, yeah. So, so you obviously weren't afraid of having them at the time you had them. Otherwise, you would have been too afraid and you would never have done it. Yeah. Wouldn't you? Yep, yeah. So, so obviously you didn't listen to your fear then. Yeah. No, but, but now I have it ah, about well, having it's, children. It's a different matter. <laughs> what about driving a car? You drove here today. Yeah. Are you afraid of that? Afraid of what could happen? You're afraid of what could happen, but you still got in the car. Yeah. And you still drove here. So your fear did not dominate your life in those two circumstances already. Have you been married? Yes. So you were not afraid to get married. So your fear never dominated you to, no. in order to stop you from doing that. No. Does that make sense? But do, you, do you occasionally there. have sex? Yes. <laughs> So you're not afraid of having sex? Um, Your fear doesn't dominate you? No. It's it doesn't not, stop you from having it? No, but it's still there. I agree it's still there, and this is something we need to understand with a fear, and this is what I want to illustrate to you. Fears can be present. The problem is when we allow them to dominate our lives and we live by them. That's when we get stuck. You see? Can you see that? Every time you choose to allow a fear to be the truth, you will get stuck, guaranteed, every time. Now, in the past, many of you have had fears, but you have not allowed those fears to prevent you from acting. It's the fears that prevent you from acting that need to be addressed, because they are the ones that stuff up your life. They are the ones that you feel are too big to handle. So you could say, remember right back again when I was uh, talking at Peter's house at, at Udlo, I drew a couple of scales on the board which I called, there was a fear scale, you remember that? 
And what's the opposite to fear? Truth. Truth. Truth is the opposite to fear. All right. So there's a fear scale, and then there was a pain scale where we have pain. Let's say, call that in a scale of one to ten. Let's call that a ten, and a zero down here. Scale of zero to ten. When our fear is higher than our pain, we will not do anything about our pain. When our fear is lower than our pain, we will now allow ourselves to feel our pain. And what I'm suggesting to you is that when you say, I'm afraid of everything, while that may, may be a degree of truth in that, that we have fear related to most things in our lives, the difference is that your fear has been less than your pain on many of those things, so that's why you've gone ahead and done things anyway. The problem is when our fear is greater than our pain. That's when we run into trouble. That's when we stop doing things. That's when we get stuck when we don't progress anymore, when we run away, run away from God, where we want to run away from our own soul, that's the time when we want to do that. And what happens initially when we find and discover the divine truth is that we have very little fear because we're in this joy of discovery mode, right? Many of you have had this. You're in the joy of discovery mode. So you don't have as much fear, and so you just go ahead with the actions. But those actions create reactions in your environment. In other words, you start getting attacked for your choices and decisions. Now your pain levels are quite high in those areas, and your fear of even addressing the pain is even higher. We're so afraid of what everyone thinks of us, how they will disapprove of us, and what kind of acceptance we'll have in the long run and so forth. And so what finishes up happening is our fear dominates our life. So that initial joy of discovery that we had of the divine truth gets lost in our desire to stay in a place where fear dominates. And we need to address this. This is a part of the facade. It creates the facade. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, a bigger thing that creates our facade is, as I pointed out earlier, I might just rub these out. There's a few here I want to come back to, but particularly, will I be loved and lack of faith? If someone can remind me of that later. <laughs> the big problem that we face with our facade is we are perfectly happy and when I say happy, I suppose happy is not the correct word, but we are content, relatively, to blame other people for our pain. Most of us have very little difficulty getting into emotional pain that other people have created in our lives. Is that not true? So, so let's say your partner cheats on you, like sexually. Most people that have a lot of grief to deal with that, would they not? Right? Now, once you've healed all of that, you'd have no grief to deal with. But, but initially, we have pain associated with the whole feeling of being betrayed and not being, you know, the feeling that we can't trust them. And there's a lot of other emotions that come up. And so we have a lot of pain associated with it that comes up. Most of us would be in that, in, that, in that case. And we'd find it relatively easy to get into that pain in comparison. So firstly, we get into the anger of it often, where we go through this process of grief, where we get into the anger first, and then eventually you know, we get out of the denial, into the anger, the in, out of the anger, into the grief of, the, of what happened, and we grieve it. And in the process of grieving it, we release it from ourselves. Right? But the bigger problem that most of us face is the things that we have done, what we have done to others. Mm. 
most of us have huge amounts of denial in that particular area of our life. And we wish to maintain the facade that we're actually a lot better, we believe ourselves to be a lot better than we actually have been. Or in fact, as you'll learn tomorrow, are even being. Uh, and tomorrow I'll be giving a talk called Spirit Life, The Sleep State. And I'm going to discuss with you what you're doing in your sleep state. And for many of you, you're going to find it very, very challenging discussion. And the reason why is because many of us in our sleep state are taking actions to harm others that we are in complete denial of in our awake state. Because we're living in our facade in our awake state. And the facade is very much harder to, hand, to, to actually hold on to in your sleep state. And the reason why it's har harder is because anybody can see the condition of your spirit body in your sleep state. Anybody can. You're totally naked, if you like, emotionally, to every single person. In your awake state, here, you have a physical body and you can maintain a degree of disconnectedness from your spirit body and your true condition. This is our problem that we face here on earth. On earth we have a tendency to desire the facade because we can't handle the damaged self. We can't, we, we judge the damaged self. We don't even want to know the truth of what the damaged self is doing to others, in particular to others. We're perfectly happy to feel what the damaged self has happening to itself from others but we are not very happy of what, about what we're doing to others. We have huge amounts of shame and judgment about it. And so what we finish up doing is we close down this whole aspects of our life that we do not wish to come to terms with. And, and this is where we get really heavy with others where we get very demanding and we get needy and we, we want others to approve of us and accept us. We want others to do what we want. We want others to say and spend time, say what we want them to say even. It's a, you know, I've used the illustration plenty of times, you know, where the wife buys a new dress and says, like, do I look fat in this? And the husband says, yes, you do. Now, how often does that happen? <laughs> Pretty rarely, right? And the reason why is because we even want the people around us to accept the facade that we want to hold on to. And so we're not willing to go further than that. Do you see? We're not willing to go further and deeper and go, no, we don't want the others to accept the facade because it's not my real self. I'm lying to them constantly by presenting the facade. You see, most of us are not coming face to face with the fact that the facade is all lies. And many of us say, oh, but I don't lie to people. And yet many of us, moment from mo to moment, we are lying because of the facade that we're constantly presenting. And yet we're saying, no, I don't lie. <laughs> And yet we're lying all the time because we're in the facade that we want to maintain and we want others to accept. Now, if you want to accept the facade, that's one thing, but also wanting others to accept it, that's quite another. Um, and in fact, causes much of your desire to damage others is, uh, is based upon the fact that you want them to accept your facade. Right. Jen, thanks. Just keep your hand up, Jen. So. My damaged self has, um, there's confusion, emotional confusion in there and I take actions based on like it yeah, see, I would put defensive. to you, that's not true, Jen. It's not your damaged self that has confusion. 
Well, where does it come from then? Well, not the confusion you're talking about anyway. The confusion you're talking about is because of your trying to maintain the facade self. You see, see, when you're actually feeling the emotions of your damaged self, you will be not confused at all. You will understand exactly where they've come from. You'll understand eventually, you, after you've finished feeling the emotion, you'll know exactly where it was produced in your life, what source it was that produced it, which person the interaction involved, that probably you might even know right down to the day or particularly the year, how old you were, that this damage actually occurred. There is no confusion feeling your damaged self. It's the desire to not feel your damaged self that causes confusion. Does everyone get that? Right? So when we feel all confused, it's because we're desiring to not feel these two things. Remember I said earlier that these two things are like the inside of the egg. They are fluid and easily flow. They, things, things are easily determined. There's no resistance. There's no hardness around them. It's our facade self. And that, that uses the excuse of confusion to avoid the clarity of the damaged self and the real self too. Both the damaged self and the real self have clarity you, you know this, many of you now, when you process through an emotion and get out of your facade and into the damaged self, you now have almost complete clarity of how that emotion was created and why, what's happening to you. And you also have emotional clarity in that moment. You actually feel connected with yourself in that moment. Does that make sense? Yeah? So, so whenever we're in a state of confusion, we're actually wanting to create confusion in order, it's one of our facades, in order to, to avoid the damaged condition. Yeah. If we come down to Joyce here. With them, just, if you keep your hand up, Joyce. Yeah, that's it. Pierre can't see you otherwise. <coughs> um, yeah, just wondering if we are all constantly in the facade or the damaged self when we're processing emotions. Or do we actually have glimpses of our real self? And if so, how do we know when we're feeling the real self because uh, the facade is so fixed? Well, let's uh, look at for the majority of what actually happens. We have a personality or some kind of true self-feeling. Then it gets passed through what our parents and our environment did to us. And then it gets passed through what we have done to ourselves and others. And then we see the result of it, looking at it. So if this is our eye, looking at the result of it, right? What we're seeing is mixed stuff the real part of our real personality mixed in with the damage that's happened, mixed into what we've done to ourselves to damage ourselves, and then we're viewing it in reverse. Right? So the reality is when you go backwards through these emotions, you may get glimpses of your true self. And that particular part of yourself you may finish up accepting. But that doesn't mean there's not other areas to look at. It just means in that particular area, that's what's, what, what you're doing. But the reality is, you're, you're right. We, we, can see, we can see the mixture of different things, the true self, the damaged self, and our facade self. And often, if you really do allow yourself to be soft in your processing through emotion, once you get through the facade, which is the hardest thing to get through, once you get through the facade, and when I say it's the hardest, it's usually the thing that takes us the longest time because we're the most resistive. And we're the most resistive to one particular thing, and that is we're resistive to the truth. And because we're resistive to the truth, this shell is like a hard shell that we're tapping on, tapping on, tapping on, but not tapping on hard enough in order to break it. And it's only the truth that eventually allows us to break the shell. And once we go through that, we will then feel the damage to ourselves and often feel the real self even underneath that damage. And you'll go, wow, I'm not even like that. 
That's not my real nature. So you know how many of you are afraid at the moment? And many of you would say, similar to what was just said earlier, that you have a long list of fears that feels like you almost fear everything. Well, this real self fears nothing. <laughs> like, doesn't fear a single thing. The real self that God created does not know fear. Now, if you think about that, and you go, all right, if I have fear and I'm justifying my fear and I'm justifying to myself living in my fear, then obviously I'm way out of harmony, harmony with my real self, am I not? And yet you'd be surprised how often many of you justify to each other your fears so that you don't go through an emotion. And yet this real self has no fear. The real self is completely fearless. Now, you just imagine for a moment if you lived your life without fear, in, a true, in the true sense of the word, uh, without any fear. It's pretty hard to imagine, really, for the majority of us, because... Unfortunately, our reality is that we have so many fears by which we live our life that we have now think the fear is justified, don't we? And we justify to ourselves and to everyone around us why we should hold on to this particular fear. Because if we don't, something bad will happen. And yet this real self has no fear. It thinks nothing bad can happen. That's what it thinks. But through all the different damage and unloving things that have happened to us in our lives, it has come to believe and uh, we, we come to this point where we know bad things can happen now. We know they can happen, but we're not understanding why they happen. But this real self, once it's in this clarified place of no longer having any fear, it cannot have anything bad happen to it. And yet we constantly justify fear to prevent certain actions that we might have taken just because and of an emotion that's just an emotion. That's all it is. All right. Most of the things that have happened to us happened to us in the past. Many of the things we're afraid of are not happening to us right now. How many of you ladies are afraid of being raped in an anarchy like situation? Majority. How many of you have actually been raped? Right, so there's less than a, a quarter of those. Right. How many of you have been raped in the last two years? None. So can you see these events happened in the past? You have already dealt with it in the sense that you have already lived through it and you're still alive. Right? There's emotions to feel about it, but you've already lived through it. So why would then you base you would you base your rest of your life on this past event? Logically, there is no good reason to do that, to base the rest of your life on a past event. There is a good reason to process through it emotionally and release the event from you emotionally. So I'm not saying not to do that. What I'm saying is that quite often what's going on most of the time is with our fears associated with living in this place here are actually fears that have all, things that have all happened in the past and are not happening to us right now. And yet we're still afraid. Now I can understand completely why a person would be afraid of the event if the event was happening right now. It makes a lot more sense, does it not? To be afraid of something that's actually happening. <laughs> than it does to be afraid of something that happened in the past. 
And for many of you, by the way, remember 75% of you ladies who put up your hand have never been raped. So you're actually afraid of an event that has never actually happened to you. Does that make sense? Does that sound logical? To be afraid of an event that's never happened to you, it's just happened to somebody else. You see, we often have these fears absorb us and we don't want to deal with them and so our fear levels become so high that we don't we, we wish to retain the belief system that doesn't make any sense logically even because our fear levels are so high All right. now I can understand a woman who's been raped being afraid of a future possible rape more than I can understand a woman who's never been raped being afraid of a possible future event of being raped. Can you see the difference? Like one it's actually happened to, the other one it's not. Right? And it's the events that have happened, that we've had happen to us, that often do dictate our future life, unfortunately, and we need to release those emotionally. But many of us, as a part of our facade have a whole set of beliefs that we constructed and that nobody else has even participated in the construction of. Can you see that? Now obviously if I have grown up with a mother who's been raped there's a very good there's now a chance that there is somebody who has participated in my belief that I might be raped. Right? And I can certainly see that, how that might occur. But it still doesn't justify holding on to the belief, does it? Because it can still be released from you emotionally to get to the real self. You see, the real self is not afraid of the rape. And we go, what? Like, how can that be? Because the real self knows all the truth. The real self... And I'm talking about the real self, once we've become at one with God in particular, is perfect, it knows all the truth. It knows the truth about life, death, sexuality, everything. It knows the truth about all these things. The real self would actually even know who would be potentially a rapist. So you walk up past somebody in the street, you would know that person there, potentially a rapist. Not a good idea to spend a lot of time with him. The real self is that switched on. The damaged self goes, I'm afraid. Uh, like I've had all this, maybe a rape occur to me, so now I've got all this emotion inside of me. The damaged self is now doing that. But the facade self goes, I don't want to know about it. I'm going to just treat every man as if he's a potential rapist. And I've heard many of you ladies actually say that all men are bastards and all men are rapists. I've heard one lady on television, we were watching a television show and she basically said that, that all men in her opinion were rapists. Sorry? <laughs> if you say that to the microphone, Peter, because it's quite funny. <laughs> no, it, it I just remember um, a little saying where uh, someone said that, um, you know, all, all birds, all crows are black and all crows are birds, therefore all birds must be black. <laughs> yes. um, and then someone else said, you know, um, all, all Indians work, walk in single file. At least the one I saw was. <laughs> and, that, and so it occurred to me, I mean, how many, how many men did she actually had any kind of dealings with to come up with a, um, a radical statement like that, I wonder. Yeah, well, even if she had a, a dealings with all three billion of, or three and a half billion of the men on the planet, that still doesn't mean that it's true either because there are still all these spirits in the spirit world. And you know, there's just... Our, our personal experience is very limited. But you're right, the logic that we use is often not, n not available. <laughs> it's not logical logic. Right. It's, it's emotionally driven logic. 
AJ, well, now that I've got the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, uh, I had the, the, uh, the thought about um, our law of attraction and how that relates to the damaged self, the real self and the facade. Could you sh shine some light on that, please? Sure, sure. Um, this, remember, the, the law of attraction is based upon many things. But remember I said this entire thing is your soul. And the law of attraction is based on the condition of the soul, which is made up of, what's it made up of? Well, so it's made up of emotions, beliefs, beliefs, desires, Desires, passions, longings, personality, memories. Well, let's just take those for 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 a moment. You can see that if the the soul condition, the law of attraction is based upon the soul condition, what the soul attracts. And the soul's condition is based on emotions, beliefs, desires, personality and so forth, all these different things. Now, can you see that in the emotional area, the facade self has emotions, the damaged self has emotions, and the real self has emotions. So obviously, all three are going together to create the law of attraction with regard to triggering different emotions, not just your facade. Now, if you look at your belief systems, the facade self has its own belief systems. The damaged selves have often a completely different set of belief systems. And the real self often has another completely different set of belief systems, sometimes in total opposition to each other. The sum total of all that will create your belief system's law of attraction who you attract in terms of who you get to talk to, who you get to talk to about spiritual matters, who you get to talk to about your beliefs about politics, religion and so forth. All of those different areas of walks of life will all combine based upon those cells as to what, as to what is actually going on. Now let's look at the desires. The facade self has a whole set of desires, does it not? It has a lot of desires that are completely the opposite direction to what the real self needs to go, but it has a lot of desires. The damaged self also has certain desires that are not met. For example, if the damaged self is damaged with regard to mum or dad never loving them and it has a feeling retained inside of them that my mother didn't love me, then it's going to keep looking for, it's going to have the desire of being loved by a woman as a part of that damage. And it might not be very selective as to which woman either in terms of how it actually acts about that particular desire. And then the real self also has desires and passions. The real personality has it. And they all combine into one set of desires, if you like, which is a very large area, and that creates an attraction. And that's a part of your law of attraction too. So what I'm trying to illustrate, Peter, is that all of these different aspects of our soul all have three primary areas associated with them. They have a facade area associated with it, they have a damaged area associated with it, and then they have the real area associated with it. And at the com combination of those three parts of ourselves cause our law of attraction. Now, once we've released the facade, then it's only two parts that control, that control the law of attraction. And once we release the damage, then it's only one part that controls the law of attraction our real self. And what we're often doing, unfortunately for the majority of us, we're often, because of the mixture of the different parts of us having a part to play in our law of attraction, what we finish up doing is we start, our, our law of attraction is working in opposite directions of itself constantly. So for example, the damaged self wants to heal. The facade self doesn't want to heal. 
So now we've got two sets of desires imposed upon the one soul. One part saying, I want to heal, I want to heal, I want to... This is why many of you say, I want to heal myself. And very next words that come out of your mouth prove that you don't want to. <laughs> because you, you go back into the facade and the facade doesn't want to heal. So what often finishes up happening is that it's the one we are afraid of most that controls what happens in terms of our will. We're often using our will in a completely different direction than what healing would require of us to use our will. And that's because the facade self does not wish to heal. The facade self just wishes things to be different. When you pray, many of you are praying from your facade self, which of course cannot be answered. A prayer from your facade self cannot be answered. And the prayer many of you are still praying is, please take this away from me. Instead of, please help me feel this. Can you see the difference? One God cannot do. And one is the desire of your facade. To have something taken away without you having to have any effort in doing so or any feeling in doing so. So your will is in its facade. In other words, you're saying you want to progress but at the same time taking actions that prove you don't. Now we've got to stop that if we really want to progress. We need to get away from our facade self and start recognising that yes, our facade self has a desire to not feel anything. And our damaged self has a desire to feel the damage. And our real self has a desire to be who we really are. And all of that is happening at the same time. And it just depends on who we're afraid of the most as to which one we'll do. And most of the time we're afraid of our damaged self the most and so we're in our facade and so we, our facade dictates what we do. So, yep. our, um, our blockages to emotion, are they in the facade? Yes, all of your blockages to emotion are in the facade. The facade is difficult because it, you, you do have to go through and experience your blockages to your emotion before you'll actually feel them. But once the facade is rubbed out in a certain area, so if you get rid of the facade there, now you have direct access to the damaged emotions. The damaged emotions will just flow out of you like, like you know, uh, water out of a jug. You won't even be able to control them, let alone try. Do you get that? Like, it, the ability to control our damaged emotions all comes from this desire to maintain the facade. That's what it comes from. While we're in this place of wanting to maintain the facade, we cannot fully access the emotion that we need to access to heal. And, and unfortunately for many of us, that's what's going on in our lives, in our day-to-day -day life. We're still doing this. Now remember, you can't be hard on yourself here because you're going to do this in some areas and not other areas. The key is to learn to get rid of the facade in all areas. Now that takes time and, and by the time you've done that, you'll probably also be your real self. Right? But we want to stop staying in facade. Right? So do you need willpower or do you need surrender? Uh, I feel you need, firstly, uh, willpower. Will. To exercise your will in the direction... Now remember, exercising your will is... Um, I'll just wait for now. <laughs> Sorry. Right, <laughs> um, so when you use your will, right, you need to have... Remember that your will comes from inside of your feelings. It's not just a thought. So many of us think we have a will, but it's only a thought. Do you, do you see the difference? A will, when you really have it, will definitely guide your actions. You will instantly act. You won't put it off when you exercise your will in a certain direction. You think about it. 
You think about in the course of your day-to-day life, the things that you really want to do, you do finish up generally getting done. Because you're exercising your will in that direction. The things that you think you want to do but don't get done, you obviously have a lot of resistance to. Otherwise, you would also get them done. <laughs> Does that passions and passions and desires well that's a part of your will i feel like we need to we need to engage our passions and desires but if we go back to this idea of will pete it's the will is very important your will is in fact the supreme gift that god gave you aside from the gift of love which you have to ask for using your will so so the reality even is that even god's love cannot come to you without your will being fully expressed so will your free will the 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 souls desire to do something which you could say is its will to do something is going to be the most dominant creative force in your life now if you're not really willing then of course there's a high likelihood you will not do so i feel will is a very important part of breaking the facade do you really want to know who you are and i put to to all of you that majority of us really still do not want to know who we are right because we want to maintain the facade and why do we want to maintain the facade because of all those fear based reasons we listed before and many more and all the anger based reasons we listed before and many more we want to maintain the facade but if you maintain the facade you are never going to get to the stage of feeling and releasing your damaged self and finding your true self now god wants you to find your true self that's what god wants of you yeah is the pro- is the process different in the spirit world to what it is here? No. It's still, in fact, in fact, in some ways, it's even a bit more difficult, because um, when I say difficult, in that your damaged self in this in this in the soul in the spirit world, your damaged self often dominates your life. But there are many people in the spirit world who still attempt to maintain a facade. However, it's much more difficult because anybody coming along can look at your body and go, hmm, I don't think you're telling the truth. (laughs) Whereas here on earth, we look at the person's body and they might be in this lovely body that I see over there and, and, and they might go, yeah, she must be telling the truth. She looks good, right? And whereas in the spirit world, they look at the body of the spirit body and go, yeah, you're not telling the truth because I can see this injury and this injury and this injury in you. So it's a lot harder to maintain the facade. That's the only difference. However, it is still very easy to live in the facade. And what I mean by that is in the spirit world, there are literally the hells are fully populated at this point in time with billions of people who are still continuing to try to attempt to maintain the facade even though their own bodies tell them differently but they're still trying to attempt to maintain the facade last week uh, i did some channeling work with uh, privately with with some people and and some of their pe- family came to talk and they wanted their family to come to talk because they wanted to see where they were in the spirit world and how they were doing and so forth and for three of the four people who came, well, all of the people, in fact, came for this particular family, were all still in the spirit world in their facade. Now, they were all in the hells of the spirit world as a result of their facade. And their facade cracked very easily by me just talking the truth to them about their, their facade. So, you know, one of the things that I did was say, have you compared the brightness of your body with the brightness of this person here who's next to you no you know like have you asked yourself why that but does that person look good yeah how do you look and then you hear silence like you know um how do you look oh, i don't look very good they'll say you know in comparison with that bright person how do you look 
yeah, he's pretty good. Would you like to be like him? And so there's a comparison that's now set up where the person can begin to see their facade. But the, the problem for most of us is we don't want to see our facade. And on earth or in the spirit world, many people are still in that state. Yeah. 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 So, so for prayer, AJ, yeah. um, prayer is, 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 if it's effective, it's the, the exercise of your will. Yes, definitely. It's the exercise of your desires, which is a large part of your will. So, so you know, a lot of people I see praying, for, like, for instance, that prayer that I mentioned earlier, please take this away from me. Now that, that is a prayer that the majority of us at some points are engaging, but it's not a prayer that can be answered. We want God to take things away without us having any experience through the process for many of us. Whereas what we need to do instead is be willing to allow the experience of the process and, and instead of praying, please take this away from me, we'd be praying and actually having a feeling that we want this at the same time, we'd be praying, please help me feel this rather than take it away from me. Now that's a prayer that God can answer. He will help you feel it and help you feel it very rapidly if you're willing to use your will in that direction. So, so what, what I find is that many people are exercising their passions and desires still in harmony mostly with their facade self. The damaged self, if you connect to her or him fully, the damaged self has a very strong desire for you to face the truth. Right? Do you understand what I mean by that? You imagine a child for a moment who's five years of age, who's just been belted by another child and the child comes yelling running up to you crying tears running down its face right and it says he built me he built me he built me and he's crying crying and you say to the child ah oh, it's not that bad just you know toughen up a bit or whatever now the child just before that state was in its real truth of the emotion the child naturally wants to feel the truth of what happened. Do you, do you understand what I mean? Now, the instant the adult got involved was the instant that we tried to make the child not feel what happened. And the child often rebels at this, yes? The ch children do not like this happening to them. And that's what your damaged self is, that child. So is that your inner child? Yeah. That you've talked about? Yeah, yeah. Often this damaged self is your inner child. Bearing in mind, of course, that the damaged self may also have been created some of the damage by your own actions, which is a different sort of a, a way of happening. But for the majority of us, the damaged self wants to know and feel the truth. It's the facade self that keeps going, no, I don't want to know it, I don't want to know it, I don't want to feel it, I don't want to feel it. And a lot of times we want to know it, we think, but we don't want to feel it. And a lot of times many of you are still talking about it and you talk to your blue in the face, but you still don't feel it. Like, it's, it amazes me sometimes how often we sit down with people and I say to them, how are you? Well, today I was processing this emotion and that emotion and then 15 minutes later, They've described all these different emotions that have happened and happened to them during that day. And I go, and why did you need to tell me all of that if you've really processed the emotion? Like unless there was some reason to teach me something, I don't really see much point. Do you? Unless we're going to discuss an emotion in order to teach somebody something about it. There's very little point in discussing my personal emotion. If I've truly felt my own personal emotion, you have no idea what it's going to be. I, I can talk to I'm blue in the face and you are still not going to feel what I went through because it was my personal emotion through the filters of my personality, through the filters of my life, and there's no way you could understand it. Why even attempt to make you understand it? 
the attempt to even make you understand it is driven by a facade. It's driven by something else. Do, do people have difficulty having extended conversations with you, AJ? <laughs> well, it doesn't seem to be the case anyway. But, but, but the majority lately are not having extended conversations with people who are in their facade. So, um, so yes, often people who are in their facade have a very big difficulty of even approaching me, let alone uh, opening their mouth, uh, because they're afraid of what I may say. And I put to you, if you're afraid of what somebody else may say, then you're already trying to maintain your facade. Can you see that? Because mm -hmm. if, if you weren't afraid of what somebody may say, you'd be willing to engage the situation come what may. You'd have that attitude more, wouldn't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rob, can we have Robert? Mm -hmm. um, this might be a furphy. Um, it feels like... Uh, I get glimpses of like big desires and passions and stuff in my real self. Yep, yep. And I'm very afraid of those because I'm looking through the filters. So, yeah, just wondering, going into inaction because it just seems too big, you know, like the, the desire. Well, your damaged self can be afraid of your real self. That, that is true. And, but can you understand why? It's quite simple to understand why. The only reason why your damaged self would be afraid of your real self is because your damaged self was taught that your real self was wrong or bad and should be punished. So it gets back to an emotion. An emotion related usually to your parents, uh, you know, and how you were treated when you were in your real self. See, the majority of children, when they're very, very young in particular, are in their real selves quite frequently. Right? And as a result of that, the parents don't like it generally because it challenges every one of the parents' emotions, particularly through the parents' law of attraction, attracting a child with that personality in the first place into their life. And so what the parent does is they try to manipulate and control the real self of the child. This is what causes the damage. In other words, the parents' lack of being able to accept what God designed in the real self of the individual causes the parents to attempt to modify it to suit their fears and their anger and their rage. And as a result of that, they project at the real self, and this causes this damage in here, they, they say that your real self isn't any good. And of course, you're then going to be afraid of engaging your real self. But again, it's just an emotion that exists within your damaged self that's causing you to do that. Now, the justification of the fear, stopping the action, is your facade. Do you see? So, so when, I, when I say, yes, this one here has some fear about what this one here is, and I'm going to live in this fear, in other words, I'm not going to act on the desire that this real self had, and I'm going to live in this fear, then now I am in the facade. I'm now trying to do something completely opposite to what my real self is. So that's a facade. And, and I'm living in this facade, justifying the fear as a reason to not act. So whenever you have a desire inside of yourself, desires often happen here, if you have a desire, feel whether it is pure in harmony with love. And if, if it's pure in harmony with love, always engage it whether you're afraid or not. There's a general rule to make for yourself. If I engage it, I'll trigger my fears in my damaged self, and if I'm open to dealing with those, I'll feel my fears still, but I'll still engage. Often, to be frank with you, often I am terrified of what I'm currently doing. <laughs> but I don't stop doing it just because I'm terrified. Does that make sense? Because how does your soul stretch? It's only going to stretch by you being able to feel the terror and yet continue to do something that's harmonious with your real self. So once you recognise what's a really strong passion or desire in your real self, don't use fear as a justification for your inaction. There is no justification for you to not act 
when you have a desire that is pure and in harmony with love. Now I can understand completely when you choose to not act on a desire that's out of harmony with love. And in fact, a point of integrity would be to not do so. In other words, if I knew that I had a desire, let's say I had a desire, let's say I was in a partnership and I had a desire, like, like myself and Mary in a partnership, and then I had a desire to have sex with a woman outside of the partnership. It's at this point just a desire, right? Now, I know that it's not harmonious with love while I'm in this relationship. I've got to either do something about this relationship and remove myself from this relationship in order to engage this other one or I'm out of harmony with love. So I know that my desire is out of harmony with love. So I don't act upon it. Don't act upon desires that are out of harmony with love. Just feel them. Don't judge them. Feel them. When you feel them, you'll find the damage that's there if you feel them. If you feel the desire out of harmony with love, you'll find the damage. If you f all other desires will come into this aspect. They'll be all related to purity of your soul and many of your desires along that line, Rob. So, so what's happening though is the fear that comes from your parents' judgment of those desires when you're a child and the judgment of you as an individual. That is what's causing you to not act upon these desires and therefore maintain the facade. And the facade is just not doing it. Just by not acting on a desire, you're being in a facade. Does that make sense? Yep. Now, the key is to not judge it. The key is instead to go, all right, whenever I have a perfect and true desire that's harmony with, in harmony with love, always act upon it. That's my sole rule, number one sole rule. Act upon my desires that are harmonious with love. Number two sole rule. Do never act upon desires that are out of harmony with love. <laughs> right. Now, you can be damaged right to the point of the hills and still hold on to those two principles. If you have something that a lot of people on the planet don't have yet, and that's called integrity. Right. If you have integrity you can make a rule that you know is harmonious with love for your soul and you can stick by that rule no matter what. And it's integrity that will actually help you through this process of discovering your facade self. When you have personal integrity, you will stop justifying to yourself your facade because the integrity position would be to not justify yourself. Does that make sense? Thank you. No worries. If we go back to Ivana, oh, Ivana behind, yep. And who, Lizzie, over this side. So Lizzie over this side. If you could leave your hand up, Lizzie, so. Um, I just wanted to mention two things, but um, so the first thing, um, sometimes I can't tell whether or not it is a pure desire. Um, so, but then I find myself still not acting anyway because I'm just afraid of doing something wrong or well if if you're not if you don't know whether it's a pure desire or not then the fastest way to find out whether it is is to still act upon it right and then see what the law of attraction brings you yeah i did that recently like yeah. my car just broke down and and then i decided oh, i'll borrow mums and so i'm borrowing mums and that feels really wrong yeah. like um yeah, but, and then, so the other thing that I wanted to say was, um, like, I often just say I, I know that there's stuff that's unloving within me and I don't act upon it, but I still don't deal with the emotions, like, like as yes. why I have them. Yeah, but, it's a good question, Nirvana. Yeah. And, and the reality is many of us do this. Like, what, what we do is we notice that, yeah, something is wrong, we, we see it in the facade, we see that something's wrong, but we don't have a diligent effort to resolve it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I put to you, if there is no diligent effort to resolve it, 
you're actually now in a worse place than if you didn't know about it in the first place. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, she says. <laughs> no, sarcastically. Yeah. Uh, no, there I was thinking that um, uh, I was in a better space because I was aware of what was going on. <laughs> But yeah, well, if you don't act upon it, you're in a worse place. Sure. The reason why you're in a worse place is because you now know the truth but have a refusal to do it. Yep. And this refusal that we have obviously is based upon another emotion that we need to discover. Why do we have so much refusal? You see, you see, for many of us, we do this quite frequently where we know we have this. In fact, many of us now... For, for if you've also if you've been feeling for a while, many of you will be able to list a page of all the things you know are wrong with you, <laughs> from an emotional perspective or a belief system or so forth. You at least a page generally, and yet many of us do not have a diligent effort to solve each problem, mm. and we have huge investments in not solving our problems. We need to recognise that, and some of those investments are we like to hold on to the problem so somebody else has to solve it for us or bend around it because that means they love us. If, they, if we solved it, then they wouldn't love us as much. And there's all sorts of whipped and weird and warped ways that we think yeah. in order to hold on to emotions that we know we shouldn't be holding on to. Yeah, something that I've... Uh, over the last few weeks, since my car broke down and stuff, um, I've realised that I had... I was in massive self-deception, which I already knew anyway because my money stuff wasn't changing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that I wanted everyone to feel sorry for me. And, um, and like, so I've still got that within me, but I had this big, like... I just had this huge realisation. I was just jumping around and like, wow! <laughs> I finally realised something to do with like the abundant stuff. Yep. Um, and now I forget where I was going with that. But, um, but you know when you had that really good feeling of you recognise it, yeah. now straight away this is where we have a choice to make. Yep. Now many of us are still making a choice. We, reckon, we have this realisation, we recognise what the proper way of feeling about something would be if we were in harmony with love or truth yeah. but then what we do is we fail to address the yeah. causal emotions and that that's where i'm at right retain now that. Yeah. yeah to retain yeah. it it's it's like i feel stuck as to where to go now because I, I still want, still want to be in that space yep so yeah now can i make a suggestion just before we go to a break the suggestion and this is a pretty important suggestion actually is to focus Firstly, if you, if you notice you're in your facade on any issue related to God. So, so any issue related to God, put that as your highest priority in your life to deal with. Higher than work, higher than eating, higher than everything, right? Put it as your highest priority to deal with. Higher than your relationship, higher than your partnership, whatever. Any injury that you have that you notice you have with God is going to have a severe impact upon your life. And so therefore it makes sense to address those issues first in your life and as rapidly as you possibly can. The second thing is to deal with the issues related to your own soul next. This includes the issues related to your soul mate in other words, treat your relationship as the next highest priority in your life in terms of issues to resolve and focus on the resolution of those particular issues next. Now, you can do this concurrently many times because your law of attraction will be bringing you many events that show you what's going on. But if you spend the majority of your time focusing on those particular issues, you will find you'll make great inroads into your soul's true nature and therefore your law of attraction will have the greatest potential to change. If you deal with all other matters first, because those two matters are too hard to address, then what you're going to find is you'll have a slower law of attraction change and you'll find your life less joyful for a longer period of time. Now that to me doesn't make much sense. It makes sense to focus on the things that are going to bring me the most joy first and then to focus on the things that bring me less joy after that. Um, 
Oh, yeah, yeah, that's still on. Um, something I've been struggling with is, uh, and I was praying a bit about, um, about maybe a few weeks ago, was actually how to put God first. Um, and then it sort of came to me anyway, just with different talks that I was listening to, but also how to put, like, my relationship first as well. Um, it's like, really easy to measure whether you're doing it. Yep. What you do is you add up all the time that you spend doing each thing. And that tells you what your real priorities are. Yep. All right? So if most of your time in the week is spent in developing your relationship with God, then you know you've got your priorities right. If the second thing that's got most of your time is your soul and your soul mate, then you know you've got your priorities right. But for the majority of us, it doesn't work out that way, hey? Yeah, no, my, my week is not like that. No, we, <laughs> you, we finish up going, well, yeah, if I added up the amount of time that I actually prayed or talked to God or wanted to learn something about God this week, it might end up to be 15 minutes of the whole week, you know? And because my priority system is out of whack, of course I'm not going to change very rapidly and therefore I'm not going to enjoy myself very rapidly either. Yeah, and also something that I um, have problems with is, um, like when you say, so the priority is to God first, yep. and then is it my soul, meaning to say me and Justin? Yep. Um, so I just struggle with putting like, uh, sort of doing that at the same time. <laughs> oh, it's know. very, very hard. Yeah. To be frank, um, it's very, very difficult to do that. I'm still learning to do that oh, okay. myself in terms of our relationship and putting God first and then our relationship next. I don't have any problem with what comes after that. So my, my main problem at this point in time is the competing aspects of my relationship with God and my relationship with my soul, mate. Yeah. But, but I don't have anything else competing now, for the majority of us, we do have lots of other things competing and we need to address that if we're really going to progress rapidly. So, so my suggestion is there is always going to be a difficulty here because, because the things you learn in your relationship, you're also sort of learning with God, right? Because yeah. God has feminine aspects, God has masculine aspects, you're going to have different issues with masculine and feminine aspects and if you've attracted your soulmate into your life, then... then obviously you, you're in a space where you want to deal with that. Many of you are not attracting your soulmate into your life because you do not want to actually put this as your second priority. Does that make sense? You want other things to be your second priority and that's why you haven't attracted your soulmate. And that's okay, but understand that that's what's going on. Many of you are also justifying not attracting your soulmate by going, Oh, he doesn't want to be with me. Well, I'd put to you that uh, anybody in their right mind might not want to be with you. <laughs> Shall I say that again? I know it sounds, <laughs> sounds a bit much. But anyone in their right mind may not want to be with you. Have you looked at that? Yeah. Right? And when you say, have you looked at that? Have you really looked at that? Or have you just in your facade with it? Because you don't really want to deal with it. Now, I feel that a lot of you are making arrangements, for example, to not be with your soulmate. You make purposely making arrangements to not be with your soulmate. Personal arrangements like where you live, how you live, with whom you live, what you do in your day to day life. You you're personally making those arrangements to not be with your soulmate. And I put to you that at the same time saying, I want to be with my soulmate, is a facade. The real, the, the damaged self is going, I don't want to be with my soulmate. Feel that. Feel that you don't want to be with them. Why? You don't want them, or you only want them under certain circumstances. Why? Or you only want yourself under certain circumstances. Why? Or you want your soulmate so that your soulmate will tell you what you can do because you've got no idea what to do yourself. Why? Look at those issues right, and address those particular issues. But if you put priority number one, God, probably number two, soul, you will find you will progress much more rapidly than if you put anything else as your priority in terms of dealing with. Right? Cool, yeah. thank you. 
Now, it's time for us to have a break, I feel. Um, so should we break for about 45 minutes? Now, if we can just leave five minutes for our friends to undo and unwrap all the things out there for us, and, uh, and then we can head our way out there. But thanks for your time. We'll continue the discussion after the break.